Welcome to Chatter. I'm David Priest. This week, author and glamour expert Virginia Postrel on fabrics, dyes, glamour, and international affairs. Glamour is very fragile and politically glamour obscures difficulties, it obscures flaws. I mean, there was a lot about the Kennedys that was not public. Uh, you know, it's very hard to maintain in the political world. A lot of textile innovation today takes place generally in the performance area that is athletic wear, outdoor wear, military wear. We live in a society where, I mean, yes, there are couturiers, but most of us dress fairly similarly regardless of social class because the textiles and the clothing are abundant. Virginia, welcome to Chatter. Thanks. Thanks for having me. You don't know this, but I've wanted to talk to you for a long time because I'm aware of some of your earlier writings, but I had uh, kind of a weird feeling with something that I've seen repeatedly at the International Spy Museum which sounds like a weird avenue into some of your writings, but but bear with me. Uh, there at the International Spy Museum, in addition to all the stuff you would expect, so technology about how to break into various facilities and disguises and stories of espionage and history, there, there is a display that talks about fabrics and dyes. It talks about red dye from uh, Mexico, I believe, and the Dutch trying to get the secrets of it. It talks about indigo from India and how the French were trying to steal secrets from the British. And it, it talks about how the Chinese protected silk from spies from Europe and elsewhere. And we'll get into those stories later, but it brought to mind some of the work you had done in a book you wrote a few years ago, uh, The Fabric of Civilization, where you talk about the long international history of fabrics and dyes. So thank you for finally joining me, even though you didn't know how long you've been wanted. <laughs> thank you. You've been a, a writer and a journalist and I don't know what to call a cultural observer for, for many years in different fronts. What what called you to the business of thinking and writing about issues that connected, that, that they weren't in a single silo, that were really connecting across many different areas? Yeah, I, that's a very good question. Um, it's sort of the inverse of an opposite question, which is I don't have I don't have any advanced degrees. And given my intellectual interests, that's a little surprising, but it's not really because I, I'm not I could never decide what I would study if I was it going to It leaves you study. free, right? Yeah. It's just, I have a great curiosity about a lot of things. <laughs> mm -hmm. And one of the great things someone once said, I saw a quote a long, long time ago that, you know, being a journalist is getting your education in public and getting paid for it. <laughs> I don't think that's true of journalism as it's, you know, sort of the modal journalist typically, but but it's definitely been true of, of my career is that I've been able to pursue a lot of my interests and find ways to turn it into writing. And you've you've hit so many topics over the years, but there has been a center of gravity, if you will, uh, around issues of economy and and culture and I don't know what to call it, mercantilism, if you will, but the whole idea of consumer consumer behavior as it relates to both economics right. and culture. Yeah, the and way I, this has played out in many ways. Yeah, the way I describe it is that I'm interested in the intersection of commerce, culture, and technology slash science. Um, that's, that's not completely inclusive of what I'm interested in because like, I'm really interested in housing. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that covers a lot of the, the topics. And another way of thinking of it is that I'm interested in the sources of economic value. Um, mm -hmm. uh, where, where does that come from? This sort of miraculous thing that takes place in commercial societies where you create wealth. I mean, how does that happen? Value is such a funny 
term and philosophers look at it one way. Economists tend to look at it in a different way. And I'm not sure either one totally matches real world experience of people who aren't philosophizing or economizing. Right, right. So economists think of it as willingness to pay. Like, mm-hmm. what is your willingness to pay? And and that I that comes closer to what I think of when I use the term value. Um, there's a whole different Hayek wrote this thing on the difference between merit and value, which I think is actually mm-hmm. a really important distinction, which is mm-hmm. this idea that value is just like what something is worth in the marketplace at a given time. Uh, it's not what's necessarily meritorious or not meritorious. And that's really important to think about um, both if you are a critic of markets or if you are a proponent of markets, because both sides tend to think that, you know, that there's something that it should, it should line up better, you know? So people mm-hmm. who are proponents of markets often uh, fool themselves by thinking that, um, you know, just because they're well paid today, that that means they're better. <laughs> um, you know, the world, uh, fortune's wheel can turn and you can be on the downside of that. Um, but it also means we, we w- really wouldn't want to have to have economic value line up with sort of moral value or merit. It, it, it would get tyrannical if you had to do that. So. Right. It, it gets tricky both ways, yeah. right? Because on the one hand, it's hard for anyone to not see that the merit of a, a nurse or a teacher is not greater than the merit of a reality TV show star. But the value in the market shows, guess what? Um, <laughs> there, there, there's, there's quite a difference between the two once you get to the, the willingness of a society to pay for a certain, uh, right. and for a certain that- good. Yeah. And in that particular example, you know, you, you get into all kinds of things like how how easy is it to aggregate? So, you know, mm-hmm, a, mm-hmm. a nurse can only take care of a few patients at a time, uh, whereas somebody who's you know on TV can reach millions. Um, and also, what are the like what's the likelihood of success? So mm-hmm. if you go to nursing school you will get a nursing job and you will, you know, if you're at all good because there's a big demand for nurses. And um, whereas if you, if your aspiration is to be a reality TV star, well, good luck, you know, enjoy your waitress job Uh, because. Wait, I'm going to take a note there because on my list of of next career options, that was at the top. So I'm going to (laughs) scratch that off. Okay. Got it. Yeah. So, um, you know, becoming a reality TV star as a career aspiration is sort of like, you know, my career aspiration. Well, not my personally, but, you know, one's career aspiration is to play basketball in the NBA. I mean, that's a great okay. job and get it. But, <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, I, I want to turn to fabrics and dyes because you did something that was remarkable. And I imagine it was a lot of fun, too, which is you research the hell out of a topic that almost everybody just takes for granted and they don't realize all that has led to where we are today and all that goes into things that we just assume happen, I guess, magically. And there's a whole history to fabrics and and strings and ropes and weaving that um, is literally but kind of below the surface for, for most people. But let's go way back. Um, how long ago did did humans or our predecessors realize that things like tree fibers could be put together into string? Yeah. So the earliest string that has been found is 50,000 years old, and it was made by Neanderthals. Yeah. Um, and, and I should say, this is definitely string. It's been twisted, and then the twists have been plied together, twisted together. Mm-hmm. It's, it's not some random vine. Um, string is a really important technology because once you have figured out that you can make string, it opens up a whole bunch of things. One is that you can, you know, tie arrowheads to spears, um, mm-hmm. or, or I guess they're spearheads. <laughs> so, um, you can make fishing nets, you can make traps for animals, you can make baby carriers, you can hang your food above the 
the ground, you know, lots of things become possible. And so string is really, 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 really old. It's really, really important. And, you know, what we call the stone age could easily be called the string age. Um, it's just that string tends to rot and it's miraculous that this tiny little bit of string, uh, from 50,000 years old has, uh, 50,000 years ago has been found and I've anticipated my question, Virginia, which is, um, was it one of those cases where it was just the right environmental conditions and freezing? What, what was it? Well, it was, I, I think it was dry. It was caught on something. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. and I, I forget what the exact conditions of this were. And in fact, the interesting thing is I submitted my manuscript at the end of 2019 and at that time, the oldest string was 30,000 years old. And between the time I submitted the manuscript and the time I did a revision a couple months later, this paper was published that identified this 50,000 year old string, uh, which had it, it had actually been in a collection for a while, but it hadn't been analyzed. Um, th there was some earlier research that pointed in the direction of this might, you know, there might be string on that. So That's that actually good timing, because if that would have come out what a few years later, then your book would have been 20,000 years out of date. That's right. Exactly. So I was lucky. I was, I was lucky with a lot of things on this book, not the least of which was that I finished it before COVID. Um, but, uh, um, yeah, so string is really, really old. Now, textiles uh, are not nearly as old. Uh, the oldest textiles we have uh, are about 9,000 years old. Which let, me, let me ask about that real quick on one angle, because I can see in my, you know, primitive brain, I can see getting from string to cord to rope pretty easily yeah. um, because the, the mental steps to get from putting together a string to realizing that you can create cords and ropes, like you said, that create nets and slings and traps, that makes sense to me. Yeah. But fabric seems much harder. And, and so it, it doesn't surprise me that it could have been literally tens of thousands of years to get to something beyond just, you know, bigger, tighter, uh, interconnected string. Right. So to, to make fabric, I think you need two things. Um, I think you need agriculture. I don't think you can get the quantities necessary to make uh, fabric in like enough to make clothes. I mean, yeah, kind of, but you need to be able to produce fleece or uh, plant fibers in quantities to make fabric. And the other thing you need to do is you need to figure out spinning, uh, which, which make, because when you're making string, basically you can rub fibers from a plant or animal together in your hands or on, on your thigh and um, you can make enough to make, you know, even mm -hmm. like a string bag or something like that. But to make fabric, it requires a lot of yarn or thread uh, mm -hmm. or string uh, to, to make it. Um, the example I always use is that the fabric in a pair of blue jeans, um, it requires about six miles of cotton yarn. Um, so to, to do that, you really need to invent a way to do it, to make it faster and, and more evenly. And fortunately, people did that. They did it all around the world. They invented spinning. And so spinning is twisting fibers and extending them. It makes it longer and stronger. And the, the basic technology there, which was invented slight variations, but again, all around the world is uh, what's called a drop spindle, which is a stick with a weight on it. Uh, you start the stick spinning and you feed the fiber onto it and the weight maintains that angular momentum and keeps it spinning. And, you know, you, and people who can do this, it looks like magic. And in fact, in many mythologies, uh, spinning is used as a representation for birth or creation because it sort of looks like something coming out of out of chaos. Uh, it's, it's, you've got this chaotic batch of fiber and you making string out of it. So yeah, so that uh, probably, oh and, the, oh, and then of course you also have to figure out how to turn that string into fabric. And the way a lot of 
really old fabrics do that is a little bit different from from weaving. It's it's called twining. Uh, you have threads that are held in tension, just like you do in weaving, and in weaving those are called warp threads. And then instead of say lifting every other one and sticking, uh, you know, running your thread through that, you actually wrap two threads around e each warp thread. So it's, it's, they didn't figure out for a while that you could actually rely on um, friction, that it didn't need to be as secure as, as the, so the earliest fibers are twined. I don't know if people can even picture So some that. of these, some of these developments you're talking about in terms of the, the spinning and in, in terms, did these, did these arrive independently in different parts of the world or does the best historical evidence show that it developed somewhere and then rapidly spread because of the obvious utility in of it? In the case of spinning, it seems to have uh, arrived, uh, it seems to have been developed in different parts of the world independently um, because it, you know, it developed in the Americas, for example, separately from Europe or Asia. Um, so, you know, I'm sure there was spread geographically, uh, but it was not something that was invented once and then spread around the world, which is something you find in you know, other, other things in the history of textiles, as well as the history of other things. Mm -hmm. Well, to the extent that people even think about fabric and clothes uh, more than in recent times further back, but certainly more than a couple of thousand years ago, I think one thing comes to mind more than any other, and that is the toga. It is this emblematic image of ancient, at least ancient Greek and, your, and Roman society is the toga. But at least in, in America, in, in my era, the, the, cultural, the cultural feeling about that is kind of one of dressing down. I'm, I'm not going to say that there were college parties in which this happened, but if there were, the idea was you grab like the smallest sheet you can find, you wrap it around yourself and you go to the party. And the whole idea is that you are dressed down and it's primitive in some way. But I suspect that it took a lot more than that. And togas weren't that view that some of us now have of them, right? T t togas were something quite important, quite different, and quite more extensive than how we right. see them now. Right. Okay. So first of all, the toga, uh, what you're capturing when you think of it as dressing down is something that the toga has in common with many traditional forms of dress that has in common mm -hmm. with sari with the, uh, the the sarong with the kimono uh, which is that the the fabric comes off the loom and it's not cut it's not cut and sewn and and tailored uh, tailoring is a late invention and for a long time it, it, it's a european invention and uh, for a long time it was only for aristocrats basically because you couldn't afford to waste cloth so you tie things, you use, you use pleats, maybe uh, you get it to shape to the body, but you don't do it by cutting and throwing away cloth or even turning it into quilts or something like that. So that's, and, but togas, one thing I learned from doing the research is togas were really big. Um, and uh, going back to the, you know, the amount of yarn required for a toga was like 25 miles of, of, of yarn. <laughs> and, 25 miles for a toga. Yeah, 25 miles of yarn. And to give some idea, um, if if you were spinning uh, using Roman technology, uh, it would take 909 hours to spin that much yarn. So that's like, if you were working eight hour days, that's 114 days uh, to make the yarn in a toga. And that's just the yarn. I mean, that assumes that you've already, you know, plucked the sheep, that you've cleaned the wool, that you, and and then you're going to have to weave it and, of course, dye it. And um, and then if you want to have a prestigious toga, you're going to want to dye it with Tyrian, you're going to want to have Tyrian purple. 
uh, which is sometimes known as royal purple. People think that it was reserved for royalty, which it was, but not in ancient Rome. It was reserved for royalty in the Byzantine Empire. Uh, so later in ancient Rome, it was just really expensive. So it was for rich people. And the, the mm -hmm. it's, it's made from these uh, gland that's in various snails that are, are grow in the Mediterranean and making it is a really disgusting and uh, <laughs> smelly process. And what's interesting about that dye, well, first of all, it's not bright purple like you see in uh, Technicolor movies set in ancient times. It, it's the color of clotted blood, it was described. And uh, so it's this sort of deep, uh, it dyes really well on wool and the smell stays. So a lot of dyeing is smelly in the process. Dyeing with indigo is smelly, but once you have it dyed and you wash whatever the cloth, it's fine. You know, your blue jeans don't stink. Uh, but if you dye with Tyrian purple, the smell stays. And uh, there's an archeologist I interviewed who actually recreated this. And she had samples of wool that had been dyed with, with this dye and washed in Tide and they were 20 years old and they still stank. And we know wow. that it stank because there are ancient Roman satirists and poets who write about rich people and their stinky clothes. And that's really important because that's how you tell us the authentic thing. It's not some, you know, no, but it's not a fake that was done by dying with red and then dying with blue on top of it or dying with lichen. Other ways you can get purple. So that, anyway, that is amazing but, that you could and, have, I mean, I remember at some point as a kid and I, I don't remember what age, but I remember reading something about Rome and the emperors, something about taking the purple or donning the purple, yeah. um, as rising to the, to rule. But it was around the same time that I was aware of in pop music of Prince and <laughs> Prince always wore purple. Yeah, right. And so for me, there was an absolutely natural synchronicity there that, well, of course, purple is the color of royalty. Prince, his very name, you know, connotes royalty. Right. Um, now, he was named Prince, and I don't think his, his parents thought that this baby we're having will end up wearing purple and being famous, but somehow something happened in there. But I never realized that in ancient Rome, some of the personal distance that people gave to the emperor might not have been solely for his own security or feelings of some kind of superiority, but also because he just stank. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> I mean, you've dug into this a lot. Is it fair to say that most classical scholars traditionally have ignored textiles or at least minimized their importance for economic, political, and organizational challenges in, in society? Uh, yes and no. The Industrial Revolution started with textiles. And so since that period, you know, there was a certain amount of attention paid to textiles. Um, if you go back to ancient texts, you find that textiles are referenced in them in various ways. Um, but it is also the case that archaeology has only really in the last 30 years made textiles a big emphasis. I mean, there were textile archaeologists before that, but they were a minority and they, they were sort of not paid attention too much. Um, and, and there are a few reasons behind that. One is just the textiles rot and there are only a few places that textiles are, themselves are found in, in ancient sites and they tend to be in very, very dry places. The the oldest fabric that I mentioned uh, was found in a cave in Israel. Uh, there's there's sites in Peru that go back, you know, 6,000 plus years. Um, there are sort of Iron Age sites in Europe that were bogs. Um, but so that's one thing. But also there are, are there are signs of textiles that aren't textiles. So for example, I was talking about spinning where you have a stick and a weight and those weights were made of, they might be made of wood, but often they were made of clay or bone or rock, uh, things, stone. 
um, things that survive. And so there are lots and lots of spindle whorls in museums. I, mean, they, I was talking to somebody recently and he was saying, you know, museums have like thousands of these and you know, nobody really looks at them because they're, if it's an art museum, because they're not necessarily very artistic, although they often are decorated. They're uh, in the ancient world, uh, in Rome and Greece and in the Viking Age and even in Scandinavia, fortunately, to up until the 1930s, so we know how they work. People use what are called warp-weighted looms, which are vertical looms where the tension is maintained by having the warp threads weighted down with something. Um, and so we have warp those weights. So you excavate a how an ancient house and you see up near a wall, there's a bunch of weights um, on the ground. So there used to be a loom there and you know, stuff has, has uh, uh, so there are things like that. There, there's mineralization or imprint imprints on uh, pottery or you know, vessels of various kinds. Uh, but people didn't pay a lot of attention. Now, partly that's because in many places it was women's work, and so they didn't pay attention. But I think just the fact that they, things aren't there, um, we tend not to think about it. It's because they rot away. And then once you get to today, we have so many textiles, and it's, they're so abundant, and they're so cheap that we just don't think about them uh, for the most part. Uh, I, I have a line in the book where I say we have textile amnesia because we enjoy textile abundance. That's great. Now, reflecting back on this, we, I mean, we've talked a lot about, you know, clothes. Um, yes, for, for emperors, sure. But, but we've talked about, uh, about clothes, but cloth was not just for clothes. And right. th this is where it gets into some actual national security applications. Um, thinking about the Roman army, as a huge consumer for textiles, um, sales for ships yeah. were, were very important. And in fact, the entire Viking age, the sails took massive amounts of yarn, right? Yeah. A Viking sail took longer to make than a Viking ship. Um, and by make, I including everything from getting the wool off the sheep, which weirdly the sails were made out of wool and that, because that's what they had, uh, to cleaning the wool, spinning the wool, which took the equivalent of 385 eight-hour days, uh, weaving the wool. And then we think of our picture of Viking ships as these, these red and white stripes. So those stripes would be the wool as it comes off the loom. So you've got to sew the panels together because the loom is only so large uh, to make the sail. And um, if you wanted to dye it, you want to have the red, scary red, that's a whole other process. So it's a very long process and it took longer to make than the ship. And um, I don't know about you, but I actually watched the TV show Vikings all six seasons. And in the TV show Vikings, the, um, the shipbuilder is a major character. Um, but there is one episode where in the background there is a loom. The the whole uh, that they one seem to episode have, in the background, That's right? It. They seem to have and they have great clothes. That's the other thing, uh, and they're not all leather. But, uh, they seem to have you know ordered their sales from IKEA or something. It, it, it's it's <laughs> it's like they don't even the TV show doesn't even think about where this uh, the uh, sales came from. Uh, in the Viking sagas, there's a hero who only cries when his sail is stolen so the, because they're very valuable they're, and they're essential. You can't, you know, you don't want to just row. <laughs> um, so, yeah, sails are a huge deal. Tents, uh, there are records of, of the Spanish writing about how the Incas had all these, these enormous arrays of cotton tents. Um yeah, bag sacks of various kinds. Uh, so one, textiles are really important. And as you said, you, clothing the Roman army or the Chinese army, uh, it was a big deal. And, and at least in China, taxes were often paid in cloth, um, which then could either be used to clothe the army or 
traded. Uh, it, it's complicated, but it could be currency in some cases. So yeah, it, it clothes, you know, we have this phrase of food, shelter, and clothing uh, as essentials. And it's not just clothes, but it's textiles in general. It is fun to talk to primarily historians, but others of different eras and hear the pet peeves, right? That a documentary about ancient Rome doesn't cover food as much as food was central to everything, um, whether it was in the lives of the main actors or more importantly, you got to get the bread to Rome. So a, a lot of the Roman Empire was about moving food or it's people talking about some other aspect of technology that in this otherwise wonderful documentary isn't given its due. And we can now add to the list fabrics. And I would argue that for the Vikings, the, the point you made is absolutely crucial because my limited understanding of actual Viking history is that what was absolutely essential was the, the technological advances in their ships and the sails, the massive sails had a huge part in that. And the process you've described, that could be compellingly represented on screen without resorting to you know, the idea that these just magically appear. Right, right. I mean, you know, it's how you write the show. I, I I, don't think it made the show bad that they had. I mean, and of course that show used a lot of imagination and made things up. Sure. It was not a documentary. It was a, a fictional show. But, but um, yeah, yeah, so this, this idea that weaving and textile creation is pervasive. I mean, ancient, mm -hmm. ancient Greece... It's going on all the time. Everybody knows about weaving. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's central to religion. Even the sounds of weaving are in every household. Um, uh, you know, Athena is the goddess of weaving. Plato, in his Statesman, uses weaving as a, a, a metaphor uh, to talk about the sort of the different qualities of, of leadership and, and uh, of the state. Uh, so everybody knows about weaving, but we don't. <laughs> and, and so it kind of goes right over our head. I, I will definitely put myself in that category, which is that I knew weaving existed. I'm not going to claim complete ignorance. I knew that there was such a thing called weaving. Um, but until I and I actually listened to your book uh, quite a while ago, um, but listening to the audio of your book, I had never heard the actual technical process of what weaving entails and then how different technology and you know the pedals and the spinning and the, how all of that came together. It's, it seems one step short of magic to me um, because it's something I've never taken part in. I've never been there. I've never actually sat at a machine of any era that, that, that did this process. Um, but it is a quite, quite a remarkable thing that obviously no other species has come up with. And even yeah. humans didn't for a long, long time. Right. Right. And it's interesting, the variety of looms that developed around the world. I mean, there's this extraordinary variety because you can weave on anything from, I mean, you can weave with like four sticks um, and, and using your body to hold the tension. I mean, you, there are looms, there are, are, um, I mean, I know a woman in Southern California who recreates, uh, the Li people of China's, uh, they, they weave on a, a loom that is where the tension is maintained by your feet and your back. Um, and, and they make beautiful brocades, uh, um, and, and, she, and she does this is how I know her. Um, it's the world's simplest technology to forget, you know, modern factories, but even like something like a Chinese or a French draw loom, which makes these very elaborate patterns and requires at least two people to run. And, you know, they're very complicated. Um, I try to describe them. <laughs> Not easy. It's the hardest chapter of the book is where I try to describe how, how weaving works. Um, so all of that. And then, of course, weaving is not the same as knitting. And knitting is a relatively recent invention, 1200 maybe. Um, but 
a lot of our fabrics today are knitted are knitted. And one thing I learned is that a lot of people don't realize that those are two different things. Uh, that that you're if you're wearing a t-shirt and blue jeans, your t-shirt is knitted and your blue jeans are woven. And, and those are two different ways of making cloth. Yeah. You already hinted at this, but I want to explore a little bit uh, the idea that the origins of modern political economy are really surrounding the issues of textile manufacture and, and the merchants dealing with the textile markets. For example, the very origins of bills of exchange yeah. were because of textile merchants, right? Right. So I, I have a chapter on, on merchants called Traders, and it's about what are known as social technology. So that's not a machine, that's a, an institution or a practice or something that makes it possible for people to do, in this case, to do business. And that's everything from written correspondence, which includes writing literacy and some kind of mail service. And the earliest business records we have are 4,000 year old cuneiform tablets, and most of them are about textile uh, related trade. Um, it includes finance. Uh, bills of exchange are developed uh, by sort of Renaissance Italians to uh, who are trading um, across Europe, which includes over the Alps. You know, you really would rather if you're going to send money over the Alps, you'd rather do it in some form other than bags of gold. And so they developed this way of exchanging letters um, where the let essentially the letters are, it's like a check. It's complicated. There's a diagram in the book, uh, which I guess you didn't get because you had the, uh, the audio version. I, I guess I could picture it in my mind, but now yeah. I'm curious. Yeah. Um, but it's, um, and a lot of banking developed out of, out of funding textiles or from it sort of textile merchants would need to do certain financial services to do their business. They would develop into bankers. The bankers would then start lending money to princes to finance wars, et cetera. And, um, you know, grow into big businesses. Um, but there's a, there's a lot of textile angles behind a lot of business uh, stories um, as, mm -hmm. as well as the, you know, as well as the industrial revolution, which is a whole other kind of big, big economic event. <laughs> so I remember quite a while ago now, one of our previous guests that I spoke with, Louis Sage Passant, um, who has studied the historical origins of intelligence collection and analysis in the private sector, not governments, but companies and individuals using yeah. what we now consider to be espionage practices. He, he talked a bit, I believe it was in the podcast, it might have been in a separate conversation I had with him, um, but he, he talked about... Uh, Jacob or Jakob Fuger, yes. a very wealthy man, maybe perhaps the wealthiest individual ever still on earth because um, of his massive fortune um, sometime, I believe, in the 14th or 15th century, somewhere in there, but it might have been earlier. But is it true that some of his significant banking operations were built on textiles? Yeah. So the Fuger family started out in textiles. Um Okay. So uh, I think it's his grandfather is a weaver. And then let's, uh, assuming I get this right at the moment, it's in the book, it's right in the book. But, uh, so his grandfather is a weaver. And then his father develops a sort of thriving textile business, which includes, as, as textile businesses often did, some financial aspects. And then he, starts he he takes that and he starts lending money to princes and then when they can't pay taking mines as collateral and so then he develops this whole mining uh, wealth and the business moves away from textiles but it does start 
the, the Fugger family business did start uh, with with textiles. Yeah, as did Lehman Brothers. Um, yeah, you know, this in, is you know, more this is great sense. because it 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 builds into another conception of mine, maybe a misconception of mine, and I'm sure every ancient historian listening to what I'm about to say will just roll their eyes. But it raises this issue that in the ancient past, that when governments or empires or kingdoms had to finance things like raising a massive army, invading a neighbor, that they could do it from resources that they could uh, themselves muster, or they could do things like demand payments from vassal kingdoms. Um, they could obviously take resources from those they conquered. And in my mind, the image of that is the cartoon bag of cash. It's it's somebody carrying a bag with a big dollar sign on it, which I realize is anachronistic that they, right. the US dollar wasn't there, but a bag of gold or a bag of silver right. Right. or some other, like you said, heavy commodity of money itself or of value itself. But then what you're talking about through through this largely textile-based political economy and through what the Fugger family did is suddenly kings can borrow and they can they can have loans and there's a banking system that allows them to not they don't need to have access to physical gold and silver in order to finance international affairs anymore. Well, they need to have that access to pay Eventually. back the loans. <laughs> there's a whole thing in the Renaissance with the you know, whether it's a good idea or not to lend to princes as opposed to other, uh, you know, businesses, <laughs> uh, because you, you, you might not get your money back. Um, and the, what the Fugers figured out was a good way to get something of value back that, that maybe when the princes didn't uh, pay back their money. Uh, but yeah, so a lot of banking develops, I mean, Yes, it develops commercially out of a long distance trade, which is much of which is textile trade financing. You know, if you're going to finance a, a, a voyage or even over overland, you know, someplace where you're going to trade across countries, you're going to need some kind of financing mechanism. Um, and and then if once you have people who are in the business of lending money, uh, one thing they can do is lend money to people who want to finance armies. Um, and then the other thing is, as I mentioned earlier, that there's also uh, not not so much in Europe, but certainly in China, there is taxation that's levied in textiles, um, among other things, uh, because there is throughout a lot of history, a problem of people not having currency. This is different from poverty. This is like you don't have the medium of exchange. There isn't enough metal. Um, and and so one thing that happens, sometimes countries will have, well, you know, you can pay your taxes in whatever this productive area is. And so in China, they developed standardized bolts of silk that were recognized, uh, that were legal tender, um, and that you could also pay your taxes in. Uh, also, taxes were levied in uh, less uh, less expensive things like hemp. Um, and then, as I mentioned earlier, that they they use some of those f as fabric to, you know, make into things that were used by the army or by the court, and and others became a medium of exchange in the economy. So then they would, you know, trade these bolts of silk for weapons or whatever. And, and uh, then they would just, the bolts of silk circulated as currency because they had sure. a short, before they, this is like really good, before the, the, the what solved China's shortage of currency was, the Spanish conquest of the Americas because the silver from a lot of the silver that went it came out of what's now Latin America went to China. But but before that, there was a shortage and they used copper coins, but there were never enough of them. Well, your reference there connects a couple of different stories I, I do want to talk about. Um, and they have to do again with the displays at the International Spy Museum that I, I mentioned earlier. So what
what I'll do is something that'll get me in trouble two ways. Um, first, I will try to describe my memory of what those brief displays say. So I may mischaracterize exactly what they say, but I'll encourage everybody to go to the International Spy Museum in Washington, D.C. and see them for themselves. Um, but then I'll also have you correct me because some of the things I say probably don't tell the full story, uh, either because of what's actually there or more likely my misrepresentations. So the first of them chronologically is a brief display about uh, China and silk and right. the fact that, again, in my memory, they mentioned that silkworms, the eggs, the cocoons, um, that at certain points and actually large periods of Chinese history, taking any of those out of China could get you a death sentence, that it was highly protected and it was a target of espionage and the Chinese knew it. And a lot of espionage practices developed out of the Chinese defending their silk industry. And again, as I recall, the reference that was there is that it was... Um, Justinian, the Byzantine emperor, who finally, in around the sixth century, um, a couple of monks got into China and did get something out. And that kind of broke the monopoly in some sense, at least when it comes to uh, the Mediterranean. So with that as a starter, please give us uh, actual details, actual context to, to kind of relate the story of China, silk, yeah. and espionage history. Sericulture is the cultivation of silk. That is really complicated. Um, there is this domesticated moth, uh, uh, the, the caterpillars of which are known as silkworms. Bombyx mori is the official Latin name for it. Um, you raise the silkworms in very perfect conditions. You feed them. They only eat mulberry leaves, so you have to cultivate mulberry trees and you feed them and you raise them and then they make cocoons. You give them sticks to make the cocoons on. Then you take the cocoons and before they, they come out and make moths, you you heat them to kill the, the insects and you then put them in warm water and you unspool the, uh, the single filament of silk, which is like a mile long. Um, so it's very, it's a very complicated process. It's amazing that anybody figured it out. And obviously it developed, it's very, very ancient and it was developed in China. And as you said, the Chinese empire, various empires, they tried to maintain control over silk. Um, it did get out. Um, it got out to other places in Asia, to Japan, uh, Korea, so Southeast Asia. I don't know the history of that, and I'm not sure anyone does. Uh, the story you told from the silk, uh, from the spy museum is basically, as far as I know, all that's known of the, the supposedly, the only other little detail is supposedly the monks had, hid the stuff in their walking sticks. Uh, but it, it did get out to the Mediterranean. So silk cultivation did spread uh, uh, eventually, um, and which is a good thing because silkworms are prey to various and sundry diseases, which play a role later in the development of, of microbiology, actually. Um, but, but espionage, I, 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 because of the way my book is organized, I don't have a chapter on industrial espionage, just like I don't have a chapter on migration, but those are the two sort of great topics that could have been chapters in the history of textiles because there's a lot right. of textile espionage. Right. Silk is a, a great, very old example. Um, you mentioned earlier uh, about cochineal. So cochineal was the one of the most valuable things that the Spanish found in the Americas. Is this, is this the red dye? Red dye. Yeah. So, yeah. And I, I, on my YouTube channel, I have two videos about cochineal. One is the history and the other is Virginia dies with cochineal. Uh, <laughs> so if people want to look me up on YouTube. They can see this. Um, cochineal is this very intense red dye and it was is much more intense than anything Europe had. Um, Europe had a something called 
Kermes, uh, that was the, the competitor, but this is even better. And it's, it, it's these tiny, tiny, tiny little bugs that grow on nopal or prickly pear cactus. And in fact, and, and just as the Chinese developed this very elaborate silk cultivation, people in what's now Mexico developed this very elaborate co cochineal cultivation over time and had this amazing dye and and they're tiny tiny they're like seeds um and you collect them and dry them and grind them and and make uh, dye um and it was one of the most valuable things out of the new world and uh the aztecs required massive amounts of cochineal as tribute and the spanish went right in there and <laughs> just took that place and and required them as tribute but the demand in europe was so high that there was also a commercial market um mm. on top of the the taxes and some mm -hmm. people started raising cochineal and there's some fun stuff in the book about that but the, number one europeans didn't didn't really know what cochineal was like the animal right. vegetable mineral they didn't know like, that's, what that's what i remember from the the display is that yeah. there it was a secret and and the, the spaniards knew but they kept it secret for a long right. time right. and most others thought they were crushed seeds and they couldn't figure out what plant it was from and so right. the right. the the international secret was you know trying to keep people searching for various kinds of seeds because it was right. throwing them off the trail and and in europe there was often known as grana which is grain you know so because it's like a little the size of a little piece of wheat or something, you know, a little wheat, wheat bud. Um, and so the Spanish had a monopoly, very, very valuable monopoly on this red dye, which was incredibly popular. And I mean, it was incredibly expensive also. And so you could own, they were the only ones who were allowed to ship it out of New Spain and it could only come in to their ports in Europe. And then from there it went sold across Europe. And so people were always trying to you know, steal the secret and transplant it elsewhere. Um, and they were really not successful. I mean, <laughs> the, the only uh, competition that Mexico had for, um, Cochineal was when Guatemala became independent. Uh, Guatemala became the leading cochineal producer. And then the, the, the Spanish started cultivating cochineal in the Canary Islands. So that was the, a big source of cochineal. I mean, it did spread. I mean, in certain places in Sicily, they raised nopal cacti, but it became more the prickly pear became more part of the diet than cochineal. It was not really successful. I mean, cochineal continued to be cultivated in, you know, in Latin America and in the Canary Islands. And it's really only synthetic dyes that displaced it. Um, the Spanish right. maintained that they were pretty good at maintaining that monopoly or, you know, until these countries became independent and then they, right. um, and they had to go to the Canary Isles, which is part of Spain. <laughs> and I got to say, going back again to, you know, teenage David reading world history, I have very firm memories of reading about, you know, the Spanish in the, the, the new world and silver being crucial, right? And also gold and many other things. And then, of course, the reverse of horses and diseases. I get all that. I simply don't remember in whatever histories I was starting to be exposed to the, the value of cochineal being emphasized. And yeah. it seems like you're missing a big part of the story. You are because cochineal is only after gold. I mean, gold is the most valuable thing exported from the new world. Cochineal is second. It's huge. And the other thing is, it's not the only dye stuff. I mean, the amount of Brazil wood, which is a sort of a cheap, dye red dye it's like the opposite of cochineal it comes from these giant trees the, the grind up the centers of them if you if you google images of brazil wood you can find these pictures mm -hmm. of the cross sections the and it's it's what the country gets its name from the the amount of brazil wood that was exported is extraordinary i just dye stuffs as 
traded goods are amazing. And actually, you know, we all learned the, the Europeans wanted to get the spices and spice mm -hmm. trade and all that. And while it is true that things like nutmeg were incredibly valuable and, and traded, it's also true that until relatively recently, the term spice includes dye stuffs. So that's, mm -hmm. you know, along with the food spices, uh, dye stuffs are being traded. Yeah. The other display I remember, and again, the, the details may be uh, incorrect or hazy here, but it was something about the, the blue dye in Bengal. So Indian indigo that, of course, the, you know, Great Britain dominated by, by the yeah. 1800s. And it was a story about a, a French spy who was sent there who managed to steal some seeds and write a secret report and ended up modeling the dye tanks and, and tried to grow them in French territories, but failed. So what is the story? We, we've talked about red. Um, yeah. I know we've talked about purple. I know green was very hard to, to yeah, do green. originally. Oh. Yeah, green you don't really get until you get synthetic dyes. Synthetics. I mean, made um, it, but it wasn't good. But we're missing that good, rich blue, that Indian indigo. Talk about the indigo okay. from what we now call India and and how that story developed. Okay. First, I want to talk about indigo more generally because it good. is amazing. Dyeing with indigo is an incredibly complicated process. Um, you have to make an indigo vat which is incredibly complicated in itself. And then you put the stuff in, you put whatever you're dying in it and it comes out green and then it turns blue. And there's a lot of complicated chemistry going on. What fascinates me about indigo is that people figured out how to dye with indigo all around the world using plants that are not even related to each other. Oh, wow. They all have the same chemical in them, but they are different plants. So they figured it out obviously in India, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, there was a version of indigo in Europe called woad, um, and that is what is in the Bayou Tapestry. And it, it, if you think of her, my ancient ancestors painting themselves blue, they were using woad. Um, so it's, it's figured out in various parts of Africa. It, indigo is dying, is taken to a very high level. There's a separate version in Japan, Southeast Asia. Uh, and, and in fact, our oldest dyed textile that's been discovered is 6,200 year old, uh, a piece of cotton striped cotton cloth from Peru uh, using yet another plant. So people figured out this complicated way of making blue dye all over the place. Uh, but some, like just as cochineal, was more intense than a version of similarly insect red in Europe, the Indian indigo was much more intense than woad. Uh, so it displaced what Europeans had used to dye with indigo. And, and then people looked for other ways that First of all, the British wanted other places to grow indigo. And in fact, I'm talking to you from my brother's home in, outside of Charleston, South Carolina, um, where, as I learned as a young South Carolinian in elementary school, uh, Eliza Pinckney uh, introduced indigo plantations and indigo cultivation in South Carolina in the colonial era. Um, there was indigo was grown in in uh, in South Carolina for a while, but I think it kind of died out after the revolution. But um, and certainly after it was displaced by cotton. But it indigo was one of the big things that the the British took out of India, um, and it's there's all kinds of uh, sort of disputed and nasty and vicious colonial history there, but. Um, it, the it, Indians in general had, they were very good dyers, not only with indigo, but with lots and lots of things. And, and in Indian prints sort of changed the world um, in a lot of ways when they were introduced into Europe. And, and so textiles were like a big treasure that the British, you know, took from India. Um, but 
and indigo was one of them, but not the only thing. I mean, the word uh, the word bandana comes from the Indian word bandani, which is a particular kind of uh, it's like tie dyeing, kind of with stitching to make little little hmm. designs. So, so when British are, are running India, they get indigo, and then along in the 19th century, sort of the end of 19th century, it's a synthetic indigo is developed and that sort of craters that, uh, mm-hmm. that whole economy. You've mentioned that a few times now, the, the, the synthetic dyes um, and, and how they really did revolutionize the, the whole making of fabrics and dyeing of fabrics. But there is that side of it, which is you have huge industries in some places by far the major industry, which, if not overnight, close to overnight, is devastated. That's a huge impact. Well, and the hu- there's a huge impact on the other side, which is, the- so dyes are big deal mm-hmm. for a long time. And when people start to develop the modern science of chemistry, one of the first things they think of is we could apply this to dyes. So this is like the in 17th century France, the French government has, you know, industrial policy and the uh, the best job is to be like the supervisor of the dye works or the inspector of the dye works, which is not what it's not a guy with a clipboard going around to make doing safety checks. It's like the chief scientist in France. Um, So the idea is we can apply this chemistry and we can make dyes and in the 18th century, you get Lavoisier, like he invents sort of modern chemistry, the terminology, gets the idea of oxidative, uh, puts all it together. So by the 1900, you have some form of modern chemistry, but you still, it, it's very hard to apply to dyes. It turns out um, that people take a long time and it's not till 1856 where this guy named William Perkin uh, who is a chemistry student. He's 19 years old. He's a chemistry student in London. Uh, he's home on Easter vacation. He's fooling around with this uh, this industrial waste called coal tar, trying to turn it into the anti-malarial drug quinine. Um, totally unsuccessful. He gets mm-hmm. this black precipitate powder in his flask. He has the idea to, to dissolve it in denatured alcohol, which he does, and suddenly it turns purple. And of course, hey, die. <laughs> he thinks you know, the textile industry is a big industry in Britain at that time. And he thinks, hey, I could, you know, I could turn this into a dye. I could start a company. I could make money. And he talks to somebody who knows what he's talking about. And the guy says, yes, we could really use a purple dye, especially for silk and cotton, because we don't have one for that. So Perkin goes out and he um, he tries to start a company. And if he had any idea how hard it was going to be, he might not have done it because he essentially had to invent chemical engineering. But he had, so he didn't invent the apparatus and the process to make not only the dye, but the ingredients to the dye. Mm -hmm. But by the mid, so the experiments are 1856, you know, by 1860, you've got industrially produced dyes, starting with what uh, Perkin called Tyrian purple, but the name that it caught on was uh, mauve. And then that leads other people to start their own dyes, making other colors, and you have this explosion of colors. And the other thing that does is it creates the chemical industry. Because once you're hiring a bunch of chemists to do create dyes for you, you start to think about other things that they could create. Medicines like, you know, quinine, which was eventually synthesized, Bayer aspirin. Bayer started as a dye works. Uh, you get explosives, you get uh, very important in you know, um, warfare and um, you get you get glues and photographic films and all these kinds of uh, chemicals, products, which really changes the world. And it also changes the balance of power because although Perkin was uh, British and he, uh, he, he 
his teacher was German and Germans were the leading sort of chemists of the day. And all of that chemical industry power, it really develops in Germany. And that changes instead of having, you know, indigo plantations in Bengal as a source of power, you have uh, um, the chemical plants in mm-hmm. Ur Valley or, you know, in, in, in Germany and, and companies like IG Farben develop from dye works. This is amazing. There, there's so much more to the, to the story of, of fabrics and dyes and how they've developed over time. Um, but I do want to ask you a couple of things on other issues while I have you, because cool. you've also thought a lot and written a lot about related issues of, you know, clothing and, and culture that I, that I think have some, some tangential, but perhaps interesting connections to the core stuff that we talk about here. Uh, one, in a conference uh, quite a few years ago, you gave a speech, um, a speech that you reposted on your blog last year, in which you asked a really interesting question, which is, why do people buy things they don't need? And the real struggle of so many people in so many industries and disciplines to to answer that question and finding there's no good answer, uh, in part because there's no clear distinction between need and want. And I see that definitely comes comes true with clothing, right? Once you're past the early stage of, you know, food, shelter, and clothing, that is clothing in order to survive as a species, um, or at least survive somewhat more comfortably, then you get very quickly to the point that you realize is innate to human nature. And you observe that you see it in interactions with children that the chance to choose our own clothes is one of the first freedoms we crave as children. Um, Talk through that a bit. Talk through how how all of this attention to to fabrics and dyes and how it's permeated history kind of seems to make sense based on your observations of these fundamental questions of what humans want and need and how that drives their behavior. Right. Well, there there are a bunch of different things that people get out of. So as I mentioned earlier, we have this 6,200 year old piece of fabric from Peru. And by any definition, people 6,200 years ago were poor. (laughs) Um, They were living a subsistence existence. Uh, And yet this piece of fabric not only has blue in it, it's striped. It has uh, the sort of beige color of the cotton as it comes off the plant. It has the blue and it has a, a brighter white, which comes from a milkweed plant. So people have gone to a lot of trouble to make this something other than a plain functional fabric. So why is that? Well, we don't actually have any idea about why it was in that context. Um, it, but you can sort of think about it. So it could be status, could be that this is like Tyrian purple. It it indicates that you're higher ranking or wealthier person in society. And when you ask social scientists, why do people buy things they don't need? This is their go-to answer. Um, It's about status. It's easy to model. It's, uh, and, and human beings do care about status but they care about other things as well. It could be that they just think it's pretty, that it's just, it gives them pleasure. They, they, uh, the world is more beautiful if you can, uh, and more interesting if you can have dyes and patterning and all that sort of stuff. Uh, It could be that it signifies some type of identity, that this is a particular group in society dresses this way or wears this cloth or, or, you know, uh, it, 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 in ancient Peru, it's likely to have been, if, if this was the case, it's likely to have been sort of a sociologically determined kind of group, you know. Uh, but, uh, but in our society, it could just be you and your friends tend to dress alike. And this is a term that's called costume echoes. It's, uh, yeah. It's not, not that you do it intentionally, but you just mimic each other unconsciously. It, it could be that it represents like who you wish you were, 
Um, and this is, I wrote a book called The Power of Glamour, which is more about not who you are, but who you wish you were. Uh, yeah. uh, and and um, it, so people want a lot of different things out of things, <laughs> out of what they surround themselves with, including textiles and clothing. And, and clothing, because it, it connects with our bodies and therefore with our identities, is particularly meaningful, personal adornment in general. So that would include things like you know, jewelry or mm -hmm. tattoos or makeup or scarification, right. you know, all, all of these ways that people adorn themselves. It's, it's something people do. It's, it's, and, and another aspect of it that um, I'm experiencing through, through my son primarily is footwear. Uh, yes, <laughs> that's footwear. Um, sneaker culture because, yes. you know, I, I don't know enough about this, but I can tell from looking at enough art across enough centuries that footwear has been a similar issue to clothing as you've described it in terms of um, what you're showing to others, what you're representing about yourself, even though it, it arose as a, a fundamental need in that sense. But the global sneaker market yes. is now approaching $100 billion. And that's not because the shoes are slightly more important for hunting and gathering. <laughs> they're, they're definitely representations and they're definitely you know, creating group identities based on whose shoe you have, um, as well as, of course, the resale market and the economics behind it. Right. Yeah. And I wrote a I wrote a piece I don't know, several years ago about how um, men's in, in the U.S., men's shoe purchases was about to cross women's. I don't know whether it has, but, um, but that's the sneaker culture. Uh, you know, it's, it's sure. this idea that men don't pay attention to their, you know, their, their fat to fashion is not true. Right. It's definitely not true historically. I mean, men were always, you know, if you look over time, men mm -hmm. are the peacocks um, uh, often. Uh, but yes. And, and that's another thing that relates to textiles is, I, I, when I think of textiles, I have to force myself to think of shoes as coming from textiles because yeah. I'm still old fashioned enough to think of shoes as coming from, you know, leather, leather but actually sure. a lot of textile innovation today, uh, first of all, takes place generally in the performance area that is athletic wear, outdoor wear. Uh, military wear, things, things where their performance characteristics of the textiles are important. But one of the, the coolest, if people say, well, what's next? One of the coolest things I saw when I was doing research was the way people are using 3D knitting uh, to pro, you can program these knitting machines and they can knit an entire sneaker, except for the sole, uh, and they can knit the different like different thicknesses, different types, the forms of knit, you know, for, for the, for the heel, for the arch, for the, where the laces go in. And mm -hmm. then you end up with this sort of funny shaped thing that you just fold together and put a sole on and you've got your sneaker. Um, and this can be, this is something people are working on. Companies are working on to produce closer to customers, uh, to, uh, produce shorter runs, potentially even customized. Um, you know, it's it's a really interesting technology, and this is something that people are doing now. And be, because you have written the power of glamour, as you mentioned, and for years you had a blog, Deep Glamour, that that looked at these issues. Um, you're the perfect person to to run this by. So, I've noticed in in some fictional representations, but then we'll get to the real world as well, that there are some, I guess, filmmakers or, or, or TV show producers who, who see the need to make glamour part of the narrative, even in fiction, even in alternate worlds. So I'm thinking here of like the Star Wars prequels, the, the High Republic, the, the fashion of the elite class is, is quite prominent. And you see a lot of different fashion displays in the show Game of Thrones. Um, there are fashion choices that, that have effects. And then there's a new show, The Regime with Kate Winslet. And as a, as a dictator of a Eastern European country, she's 
you know, kind of the Ava Perone concept of what she's wearing and what she's representing matters. But it's not just in fiction, because when it comes to glamour, I think one of the things that comes to my mind is when John Kennedy became president, he and especially Jackie, um, it almost became a tool of diplomacy. You know, he would travel to Paris and say, well, you know, you may you may recognize me as the husband of Jackie and, and Jackie's sense of fashion and her glamour was was part of the appeal and part of trying to make America cool on the world stage. And I'm wondering what what thoughts you have about that role of glamour in terms of national leaders trying to be glamorous and be seen as glamorous, because I see it as less so in recent years, but I don't know if that's just a, a Jackie Kennedy effect that we, we haven't had another pure Jackie Kennedy at that level, even though Michelle Obama got a lot of conversation about her fashion choices, even though presidential suits, I mean, if you wear a taupe suit in the White House, um, Ronald Reagan did it, Barack Obama did it, they got different levels of attention for it. I'm curious about your thoughts on this whole topic. So I start off with the idea that glamour is not the same as fashion. <laughs> that glamour is a, as I analyze it in that book, that glamour is a form of visual persuasion. It's a form of rhetoric. Almost anything can be glamorous to the right audience. Uh, that glamour is, a, is it's like humor. There is an object and there's an audience. And the way you find out whether something is glamorous is that the audience responds in a certain way. It has this feeling of if only and this projection and longing. And, and part of that is this sense of, um, you, as I was mentioning earlier, the self you wish you would be this escape and transformation. Um, so that if you go back to something like, the way Kennedy used glamour and, and Jack, he was a glamorous figure and he represented a kind of America that America wanted to be, or at least a certain portion of America wanted to be, you know, it was young, it was vigorous. Uh, it was worldly at a time that America was not so worldly cosmopolitan. Um, and, and Jackie's, you know, speaking French and, and being, you know, wearing uh, couture fashions and all that uh, represented a kind of America coming of age and being able to keep up with the big boys. You know, that there's that, that quality. It's very grounded in that moment. Um, glamour also always includes some illusion. Uh, mm. The original, the word mm. glamour originally was a Scottish word that meant you you know, a literal magic spell. You cast a glamour on somebody and they saw things that weren't there. So glamour is very fragile and politically, uh, I mean, you know, I, I, I call this illusion grace. It's, it's glamour obscures difficulties. It obscures flaws. I mean, there was a lot about the Kennedys that was not public. Uh, you know, um, it's very hard to maintain in the political world. Um, and so I, in, in the book, I talk about charisma versus glamour and why, you know, if you're, a, if you're a politician, charisma is easier to make maintain it's harder to have because it's sort of an intense personal quality but it's easier to maintain you know when barack obama ran for president in 2008 he was a very glamorous candidate and that's you know people were projecting all kinds of things onto him um you know as he became president he might be a symbol but he was less glamorous um uh, so there, there is that. And, and I think a lot of what we struggle with today is if you have a glamorous vision of America as the shining city on the hill, as, as Ronald Reagan used to put it, and then you, you know, see America doing this bad thing or that bad thing, or people criticize America for doing this bad thing or that bad thing, how do you maintain your sense of patriotism. I don't know what to call it. You know, this sense of mission, the sense of, uh, or cohesion, uh, even, um, 
I, I don't have an answer to that, but I think that that's a part of what's going on in American politics today. We're coming to terms with, and, and not very well, with the fact that um, the that the glamorous vision of America, while inspiring and and good, is also it, it, it hides things and it, it is an illusion. And so then the, the, the question is, can you go from glamour to just regular, like just mm -hmm. true, or do mm -hmm. you have to go from glamour to horror, which is <laughs> often what people do. I, I right. mean, not in this context, but in general, it's like right. if you're hiding something, it mm -hmm. must be something really bad. It can't right. just be, this is the way the world is. It's boring. It's imperfect. It's got, you know, trade-offs, it's got flaws. Um, yeah. yeah. I think it is interesting and I'd, I'd have to have a whole separate conversation with you about this uh, offline, but the idea that in some pop culture, the more flamboyant the fashion and perhaps not glamorous in that sense, but at least flamboyant, the more that's represented as like the dark side of elite society. Um, so you get that, of course, in those Star Wars prequels. But of course, the Hunger Games is huge on this, that the the ultimate elite are ridiculously bright dyed clothing, flamboyant presentations. And, and that partly reflects traditionally, if, if you if you, you know, talk about the Renaissance, that the people yeah. who are in the paintings are wearing these really fancy yeah amazing clothes that is not how the average joe dressed <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so we live in a society where clothing is i mean yes there are couturiers who make things that are require enormous amounts of handwork and exotic requirements uh materials and stuff but most of us dress fairly similarly regardless of social class because the textiles and the clothing are abundant. Mm -hmm. But if you're doing the Hunger Games, you're doing the Star Wars prequel, you know, something like that where you have an aristocracy, you often will put them in yeah. more flamboyant costumes. And of course, costuming is a whole other art, like right. expressing character and situation through That's clothing right. in a yeah. film. Or, or, yeah, or, they're really signaling yeah. to the audience, yeah. you know, that this is this is these people are different um finally on this general topic of glamour i'm curious you know i think about the current political leadership or uh, you know people seeking political leadership in the united states now and and i'm not immediately coming to mind with with glamorous right i get i get that uh, donald trump can be flamboyant especially in his architectural and home decorating style but his standard is a you know simple suit, red tie. Joe Biden um, does not come across as as glamorous. Um, now, but but some other people might like on the international stage. Now, the only idea that comes to mind is like a, a Trudeau in Canada who has presented himself um, and and be, perhaps been presented as um, more of a glamorous figure. But who comes to mind in recent years in your mind in terms of people? involved in international affairs or, or world politics who, who are capturing this idea we've talked about of glamour. Right. Well, I think, I think Trudeau is a good example because it's not only that he's, you know, he, he and, and obviously the people in Canada find him very unglamorous, but there are, he did have this kind of harking back to this early, you know, to his father and his mother and this sort of earlier idea that who were considered glamorous at the time. And he was young and uh, good looking. And so he's kind of, you know, we could be like that. I think he's, I, I don't know, I'm not an expert on Canadian politics, but I suspect that like, like Obama, uh, you know, he was a glamorous candidate as an actual office holder, he becomes yeah. less glamorous because you see mm -hmm. where the trade-offs are. Sure. Um, I think that Trump for some of his core supporters is still a kind of glamorous figure. Mm -hmm. um, his main thing is charisma and entertainment. It's not mostly glamour, but he did come out of the real estate and hotel industries, which are industries that 
traffic and glamour. I mean, you know, glamorous shots of this could you could live here. You know, this could be your apartment. You know, look at this resort. Think of yourself going on vacation. What a wonderful thing it would be. And the other thing is he's also the man on horseback, which is sort of the, the glamorous rescue figure, um, which is also what makes him dangerous. Uh, but but he, people project onto him, uh, mm -hmm. people who support him project onto him all kinds of things that I would say aren't really there, but they that is sort of hopes and fears their idea of what a businessman is, you know, that they see him as a successful person. So there is a kind of glamour there, but then there's the horror. That's the flip side. Mm -hmm. And it's been very hard for Trump critics to treat him as a normal politician to, mm -hmm. to, uh, you know, uh, um, to critique him without resorting to horror. Uh, and and so you know that that's an interesting example of, of glamour and horror. And I did write a piece in 2016 for the Washington Post about Trump yeah. and glamour. You, you know, you mentioned the man on horseback imagery, and of course, I immediately go to Vladimir Putin, who literally yes. oh, put yeah. out the image of him was on horseback and has tried to create that that image in various different ways, not yeah. just the, the horseback ride. He has definitely tried to use glamour, and I think he's used it pretty successfully for his domestic audience. Um, right. You know, right. the, the glamour of a resurgent Russia, and uh, you know, with a great leader, and it's you know, glamour in politics doesn't work super well in democracies. Um, hmm. it, 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 but it it can work in a more you know a, a more dictatorial system. Potentially, uh, and partly it doesn't work super well in democracies because unless you have a cooperative press, I like Kennedy because you, there's always like dirt. <laughs> you know? Nobody's perfect, and so you can't keep up the uh, the glamour because or, aside from dirt, there's also just you know compromise. And yeah. I mean, partly what we see today, I think, in the Republican Party is this idea that. There's a glamorization of the idea of fighting, uh, mm -hmm. and as a you know never compromise, and so you never win, but you sort of never you win by losing. Mm -hmm. Well, Virginia, this has been fascinating and wide ranging, but we're, we're not quite done yet because our tradition on chatter is at the end I reach into our so called chatter box, which I would say is a very glamorous box, um, in which we have a bunch of pre printed questions, and I pick one out at random to oh, wow. ask you. <laughs> I'm not sure it'll get much more random than what we've done here, but let's see. Recommend any recent book you've read or podcast you've listened to. So uh, I listen to books and the books I listen to tend to be lighter reading. Mm -hmm. uh, although I did listen to an amazing Moby Dick and an amazing uh, Middlemarch, uh, uh, which I had read Middlemarch, but I hadn't read Moby Dick before. Uh, but the, anyway, I, I wrote a post on listening to long Victorian novels or long 19th century novels. Uh, but but the, the, the book I would recommend listening to, which is just a lot of fun, is called uh, The Rosie Project, uh, which is, uh, I guess I would describe it as a a romantic comedy from the point of view of the man, which is unusual. And oh, wow. that's a lot of fun. And then uh, another book that I've listened to, and then I bought the paper version so I could read it. Uh, that's a little more serious is called fifth son. And it's a history of the Aztecs um, and a very interesting book. Um, Great recommendations. Uh, um, like in the sky. I like the, I like the range there. Um, I'll give you one in, in return if you do like audiobooks, um, completely apart from what we've talked about here. But it's one of the first audiobooks where I've um, obviously been interested in the content. It's a book I've read several times, but I recently downloaded the, the audiobook and I was mesmerized by the vocal performance. I was replaying parts of it because I realized I, I was so focused on the delivery that I wasn't absorbing the content as much. And it was The Demon Haunted World by Carl Sagan, but it was read by the uh, actor, English actor, Carrie Elwes, uh, most famous to American audiences for The Princess Bride and 
Robin Hood men in tights. Um, but his delivery is simply beautiful. And just listening to his voice, it's one of those where I had the conscious thought I could be listening to him reading a cookbook or some, <laughs> some other just list of items. And uh, I would enjoy it because his delivery was so masterful. Yeah. I mean, when these audio book narrators are good, they're amazing. I listen, I actually listened to all the Harry Potter books, which I had never read. Mm. And the guy who does that, he, he does like 200 some odd voices is amazing. And, and the guy who did Moby Dick was amazing too. Mm. and brought out a lot of yeah. the humor in the early parts, which I had been unaware of. Mm. Well, Virginia, thank you again for taking the time to chat about so many things here related to issues of fabrics, dyes, and glamour in international politics. I appreciate it. Thank you. That was Chatter, a production of Lawfare and Goat Rodeo. Please subscribe to the podcast and find us on Twitter at That Was Chatter. Thank you.